Today is another youth Sabbath. And my son and I will be bringing, by the help of God and His Holy Spirit, the message this morning. And so before we do, let's just have an opening word of prayer, shall we? Father in heaven, Lord, I know that you are softly and tenderly calling even right now. And I ask that your Holy Spirit may speak into every single heart this morning. Please remove any distractions, any demonic angel here. But fill this room, your sanctuary, with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Because my dad and Pastor Pal have been talking about Acts, we are going to look at a young person from Acts. That's right. We're going to look at a young person from Acts. And actually, in the book of Acts, there are three times where young man is mentioned. The first one is found there in Acts chapter 7. If, if you remember that they put the coats of the men that were stoning Stephen at a young man named Saul. The second instance where young man is mentioned is in Acts chapter 20, uh, the story of Eutychus, which we're going to look at today. But the third place where the young, a young man is, is mentioned in the book of Acts is in Acts 23, verse 17, talking about Paul's nephew as he took a message with a centurion on Paul's behalf. But this morning we're going to look at and study at the life of Eutychus, a young man in Acts chapter 20. Please open your Bibles with me to Acts 20, verse 7. Acts 20, verse 7. Acts chapter 20, verse 7 there. We'll begin reading. It says, On the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread. Wow, before we get to Eutychus, that sounds like Sunday service. It does sound like, like Sunday service. Um, and it says there that they were breaking bread, and Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke and continued with his message. You see, there are two types of time reckoning that even exist today that existed in the days of Jesus. There was the Roman way of reckoning time and the Jewish way of reckoning time. The Roman way is kind of what we are familiar with from midnight to midnight. And the Jewish way of reckoning time was from sunset to sunset or from sundown to sundown. And we even have that today. Right? We have from midnight to midnight where the world tells from one day to the next. But as spiritual Jews, we know that the day begins and ends from sundown to sundown. And this is why uh, the Sabbath begins from sundown to sundown. And, and so this meeting here that began on the first day of the week when the disciples began together. Actually, if, if the day begins at sundown and they're beginning this meeting at the first day of the week, what time of the day would it actually have begun? Saturday evening, right? Because Saturday evening or Saturday night is beginning already the first day of the week. It's already beginning the first day of the week. And actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Danny if he can read uh, there from a modern translation, Good News, the Good News Bible, it's a uh, modern translation, a very good reading, and, and it's interesting on how they, they word it there. Pay attention on how they, they word it. I'm going to ask him to read from verse 7 all the way to verse 12. Go ahead. On Saturday evening, we gathered together for the fellowship meal. Paul spoke to the people and kept on speaking until midnight since he was going to leave the next day. Many lamps were burning in the upstairs room where we were meeting. A young man named Eutychus was sitting in the window as Paul was talking. Eutychus got sleepier and sleepier until he finally went sound asleep and fell from the third story to the ground. When they picked him up, he was dead. But Paul went down and threw himself on him and hugged him. Don't worry, he said, he is still alive. Then he went back upstairs, broke bread and ate. They, 
They took the man home alive and were greatly comforted. Amen. So did you notice on how it even began? How, what are the first words there in verse 7? On Saturday evening. On Saturday evening. You know, so, so this isn't advocating or promoting a Sunday morning worship service. But even a Saturday evening meeting that as Paul is ready to depart, he has something to say before he leaves to those church members. And he wants to get it across that they go all night long talking. They go all night long talking. So whichever reckoning you use, whether it's the Roman from midnight to midnight or from sunset to sunset, it clearly doesn't indicate here a Sunday morning service. Okay. So there is no evidence here of, um, as, we, as we saw here, of no Sunday morning service. But it says they broke bread. Yes, it does. <laughs> uh, if you look at Acts 2.46, you can see there that breaking bread can be used in two ways. Either a fellowship meal, where they just eat, um, and they're having a fellowship meal, a potluck, or it can also be referred to the Lord's Supper. It can also be referred to the Lord's Supper. And this could have been a Lord's Supper or could have been a fellowship meal. And even if it was a Lord's Supper, it does not indicate still the sanctity of Sunday observance. Of Sunday observance. Sometimes we participate in the Lord's Supper with our shut-ins throughout the week. And we are not, you know, making that day of the week a holy day now. But we are just participating in the Lord's Supper. But here we can see, and um, I'm, can you read again verse, uh, verse 7 as... As it, as it says there that, that they were eating. Verse 7. On Saturday evening we gathered together for the fellowship meal. Paul spoke to the people and kept speaking until midnight and she was going to leave the next day. So there you can, you know, we can see it again from the easier translation and also if you read Acts 2.46 where it says they broke bread daily. They broke bread daily. They weren't having the Lord's Supper every day, but it can also imply to just eating a meal. Just, just how we will today after the church service, they were eating a meal. So if we continue there in verses 8 and 9. In verses 8 and 9 it says, There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. And in a window sat a certain young man named what? Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by slept, and as Paul continued speaking, fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. Can you imagine being in a, in a crowded room with many lamps? The Bible says there were many lamps. And with lamps, what comes with lamps? Heat. The hotness and, and the steam may be there. That Eutychus picked the perfect spots, right? by the window, enjoying maybe the cool breeze from the outside, and also trying to stay away from the heat of the hot lamp. But eventually it got too much to him that he what? Began to sleep, to sleep, and to sink. I don't know if you have seen someone sinking into sleep. It, 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 it reminds me of a wedding that I was at when I was when I, when I was, uh, and I'm just remembering this, we didn't even go over this story, um, that, that uh, I was one of, um, I'm not sure how you call them in English, but the groomsmen's maybe? And we were lined up, the men on this side and the women on this side, the, the ladies on this side, and there was candles all on top of the platform. And I started to get dizzy, just dizzy. And thank goodness that the groomsman next to me just held on to my arm because he felt that I was rocking too much. And so here you can imagine young Eutychus with all the lamps. You know, he begins to sink and to sink and to sink. You know, I don't know if you have noticed, but uh, someone sleeping at church, you, you may think that I don't see it, but I see anyone from up here <laughs> who began, because you began to sink and to sink until, <laughs> until you're gone. It hasn't been me. No, it hasn't been you. That's right. 
But as Paul continued speaking, Eutychus slowly began to sink, as we see there, until finally it got too much and he went what? Head first out the window. Head first right out the window. And the Bible says here that he fell from what floor? The third floor. And I would, I would even go to say that from our standards, it would, it would even be the fourth floor. Because you see, both in the Middle East and in Europe, and even in some places today, the ground floor, they don't count it as first floor. The first floor, normally they count as the floor right above, which we would call the second floor. Uh, if you go to, to some hospitals and you want to go to the first floor, it's normally called like lower level sometimes. And the first floor is called what we think is the second floor. So it's about 30 to 40 feet high that Eutychus fell comfortably asleep and just went head first down until he hit, we don't know if it was dirt, the road, but it was serious head trauma that what? It killed him instantly. It just killed him. What if he just got knocked out? What if he just got knocked out? Well, can you remind me on who wrote the book of Acts? Dr. Luke. Dr. Luke. And Dr. Luke, just like your grandfather was a doctor, doctors know when a person is a dead or alive. And what does Luke say? He is what? Dead. dead. He took him up dead. So, so he, he took him up dead. So then we know that, that he wasn't just knocked out. So what does Paul do? Well, let's look there in verse 10. You can see there what Paul does after he, after Eutychus falls down and they find out that he is dead. In verse 10 it says, But Paul went down, fell on him, and embraced him, and said, Do not trouble yourself, for his life is in him. And when they had come up, had broken bread and eaten, and they had taken a long while, even till daybreak he departed, and they brought the young man in alive. See, he was dead, and now he's alive. And they were not a little comforted. I mean, they were a lot comforted. So just like Elijah, when Elijah raised the young boy, what did he do? He laid on top of him. Elijah laid on top of the young boy and breathed and prayed and God resurrected that young boy. So Paul does the same thing. And actually, can you read in the Bible, um, in this translation, there, verse 10. Acts 20, verse 10. But Paul went down and threw himself on him and hugged him. Don't worry, he said. He is still alive. So there you can even read it that he threw himself on him. And, and in, in my Bible it says he fell on him just like Elijah did to resurrect that young boy in the Old Testament. Paul did the same thing and God did a miracle and resurrected Eutychus from the dead. Amen. Amen. So what does this story have to do with you, Sabbath? Well, it has a very important lesson for you, Sabbath. And I chose this story, and I purposely left out. If we look there in Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. The word here, now I'm going, I'm reading from the New King James, and Danny is reading from the Good News. And I know some of you may have the King James. But the Bible says here, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message. And your version says what? On verse 7. On Saturday evening we gathered together for the fellowship meal. Paul spoke to the people and kept on speaking until midnight since he was going to leave the next day. So Paul spoke to the people. Now what did the King James Version say? He preached. Very good. The Bible, you know, so, so that's you know, also some, a little bit that can, might bring a confusion, but just, just for those that are familiar with biblical languages, the word here that Dr. Luke uses, it's not the word that he preached to them, but, but it's the actual Greek word, dialegeto, which where we get the word dialogue. They were dialoguing. They were just talking. They were conversing. He wasn't necessarily preaching a sermon to them, which also helps that it wasn't a regular uh, worship service. They could have been talking about church growth, about mission work, about um, sending missionaries, or, or maybe um, assigning apostles or disciples, or 
deacons or deaconesses there in the local church. Who knows what they were talking about, but they were dialoguing. They were talking. And this is the point, church. This is why I chose this sermon for you, Sabbath. While the adults, while who? The adults. the adults are talking to themselves. While the adults are dialoguing amongst themselves, a young adult falls out. Don't miss that. While the adults are talking church talk or business talk and talking amongst themselves, a young adult, a youth, drops out. Adults do like to talk. My sisters and I know how it is like waiting for you guys to talk. Yeah. <laughs> and we are guilty of that. And I know that my children sometimes are just waiting for us to finish talking because we do like to talk. And the point is that in the process of our talking and talking, which may not necessarily be bad, but in our process of our talking, our youth and young adults are watching and listening from a distance as we linger on in our own business, in our own conversation, when they should be involved in the conversations as well. If we're talking about church, the youth and young adults should be involved in the conversations as well. Young Utica should have been involved there. Paul was talking about church growth or sending missionaries or whatever it was. We have a generation of young people who are in the church, but yet they're not in the church. Amen. They come to church, but maybe because their parents brought them, or their boyfriend or girlfriend brought them, but they're not into church mentally or spiritually. And we need to be careful, and I want to share with you an article that I read here from Ministry Magazine. This was written back in 2008 from Pastor Alan Martin. These are, this is astounding. The article is entitled, Reaching Out, Making a Difference with Young Adults. And so it says, Danny, come over here. Here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote from um, Pastor Martin. As, as he did a research, okay, on why uh, youth are, are leaving the church, on what's happening with the, the Seventh Avenue Church in the United States, okay? And I'll wait for that phone to stop ringing. <laughs> so here this article says, the medium age, the what kind of age? The medium age of Seventh-day Adventist community in North America, including the unbaptized children in church's family, is what, Danny? 58. Is 58. The medium age of Seventh-day Adventist community in North America, including the unbaptized children in church families, is 58. And he goes on to describe on how this is mostly only in Northern America, in the United States of America. In other places, he's not, the research isn't including Canada and Central or South America, where youth are more involved in the church. So here we can see, and these are alarming research statistics that, that tell us that our youth are dropping out. That our youth are dropping out. There must be some youth that haven't left. And praise the Lord, there are some youth that haven't left. And right now, uh, I praise the Lord for the youth that have been participating here. But this past December, and this coming December, in the New Year holidays, there is a group of young people, hundreds of young people, of youth and young adults will meet for their annual GYC conference, which is a generation of youth for Christ. And these are young people and young adults. And actually, actually, they have an age limit. I think once you reach 35, you can't, it's not for you. <laughs> they purposely targeted for young adults and youth. These annual conferences where they meet every year during the New Year holiday. 
Because while the, while the world and the world youth might be celebrating by partying or doing other things, they are gathering together, learning how to preach, learning how to do outreach and doing those things and spending their time getting closer to God during the New Year holiday. They pay for their own way. They come from everywhere. And why is that? Because they are tired that maybe at their churches they aren't being used and aren't being enlisted, so they enlist themselves. And they started their own conferences, they, they invite their own speakers, they do their own outreach. And so if they, they feel if our church isn't going to put us to work, we'll put ourselves to work. And this year, this December, during the New Year holiday, it will be held at, in Houston, Texas. So if any of our young people want to go, it will, it's, it's closer to home. It's, it will be right here in Texas, in Houston. But you got to pay your own way, find your own transportation, and, uh, and you will be blessed by God. You will be blessed by God. I wanted to share also just another reason why, according to, to here, to Ellen Martin, on why the youth are checking out, why the youth are leaving. It says, leaders, leadership across Adventism concurred. Okay, so this is leadership across Adventism. We're talking to Adventist pastors and leaders. Concurred, startling that the reasons most frequently cited by persons who leave local church fellowships are, and here they are, in the realm of relationships, okay, relationships, the absence of a sense of belonging, they feel that they don't belong, and the lack of meaningful engagement in the local congregation and its mission. So why do they feel, why has it come back that the young adults or young or youth are leaving? They feel that there is no relationship there for them. They feel they don't belong, but a lack of engagement in local congregation. That they're not, that they're not being used in the churches and the mission of its church. So just like young Eutychus, while an, an adult, a young adult, while the adults are talking amongst themselves, not involving the youth, they are falling out. And we need to be careful, friends, because our youth today are here. Praise the Lord. They're here. And they have been here. And I know that they want to do something. And once a year, just putting them you know, up here or to do something, once a year isn't enough. And this is why your pastors of this church are enlisting any youth. Don't miss this now. This is why the pastors of your church are enlisting any youth from any church that wants to be involved in this church. Yes. Now we're not trying to take away youth from other churches. No, no, that's not our goal at all. Our goal is to have them active in ministry, active in the work of of God. Active in the work of God. <clears throat> and this is why we are having yet another youth Sabbath. After just having adventure Sabbath with our younger ones a month ago. And then having a youth Sabbath two months ago. And you will be seeing it more frequent and more frequent. And this is just the beginning. In the near future, friends, we are going to have a revival, a week of prayer held directly by our young adults that have been taught how to preach. Amen. 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 We say amen, and I like to hear amen. 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 Well, friends, if we say amen and we say let's pray for our youth, then I want to see you support the youth, friends. It is discouraging and the youth have told myself and Pastor Ross and when we have an AY in the evening, how many few adults come. Do we love our youth? We say amen. We pray for our youth. We say let's pray for our youth. But yet when the youth want to do something, we don't come to support them. So what should we do? What should you do? Thank you for asking because I'm going to keep on saying something. <laughs> Amen. Well, let us, Danny, and the rest of the youth, let us adults know 
what, where you want to serve, what you want to do. And so I want to appeal to the youth, I want to appeal this morning both to the youth and to the adults, to the entire church, every age. Appeal to the youth, to all the youth and the young adults, to let us know, let Pastor Austin and myself know what you want to do, where you want to serve. How can we help you to do something? There is a sign-up sheet in the back. There, are, there is a table of the glow tracks that we put out every first Sabbath to take a packet to share with your friends and neighbors in your community as you share the light to the world. A table right next to that where it's only for youth and young adults to sign. And I want, I appeal to you, I'm, I'm now th putting the ball on your court. You want to be more involved in this church? You want to see a change in this church? Then put your name and put on how or what you would like to do. Where would you like to be active? Would you like to be playing your instrument up here while we sing the songs? Would you like to maybe be preaching? Would you like to be anything? Or maybe there is a new ministry that you would like to see. Give us your input. Give us your input as you sign up on that sheet as well. And I want to appeal to the adults, to the adults to let the youth get involved. Let the youth get involved. Let them make their mistakes. And although their ideas, you know, may not be a good idea, let them try it out. Let them try it out. Support the youth and the young adults by coming to their events. By coming to their events. You know, when we have Pathfinders and Adventures induction, it is not just only for the parents of the children who are in Pathfinders and Adventures, but that is mostly all who we see. Come, as they say, put your, put your what? Put your money where your mouth is. Come and support the youth. Support the youth in their events. And because in this church, you, you see, in this church, we don't have a youth church that meets in the gym and uh, a children's church that meets in the chapel. No, we just have church of all ages at the same time. And it includes every age. So my appeal to you this morning is to not let our youth fall out. Not let our youth drop out. And the only way that that will happen is to put them active in service for God. Amen. They're still doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Yes, that may be true, but so are us adults. They may have habits that may not be pleasing to God. I can tell you right now, so do we adults. So there is no reason why we cannot give our youth a chance. Amen. And let them know, number one, that we love them. Yes. Amen. Let's not forget that we were youth at one time too. I still am a youth, by the way. <laughs> that we love our youth. And that we support them. And if they make a mistake, we just tell them, buddy, you made a mistake, but this is how you do it. Let me help you in how to do it better. So my appeal is both to the youth and the adults this morning. So how many, how many young people this morning here want to be more involved? Just raise your hand. How many young people and young adults want to be more involved? So I at least have an idea, you know. Now I know that's not how you raise your hand in school. If you want to be more involved in your a youth and a young adult, stand up. That way I can really see you. Just stand up if you're a youth and young adult and you want to be more involved. Amen. 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 Very good. Amen. I have a photographic memory and so I'm remembering. <laughs> now some of you, I don't know who you are, but that's okay. No, no, keep standing. That's okay. I will get to know you and I'll ask Austin to take a look in case I forget who are these people that are standing. Now as they have stood up, how many us adults will stand with them and say, you know what, we'll support you and we'll take you and lead you into how to minister and serve God. How many of us will support our youth? Amen. Praise the Lord. 
That's okay. I know some remain sitting, but there's more standing. <laughs> That's all right. Praise God for that. Friends, I praise the Lord because when I was a young person, I know I made many mistakes, but I praise the Lord that our church put us to work and put us to do something. So let's keep our youth here because when we soon, if Jesus does not come, you know what's going to happen to us. We will age and we will go to sleep. And the church will continue going. And I pray that this church, the Cleburne First Church, continues going strong as it is today. Amen. And so let's, let's train and lead our young people that will continue being here if we are not here. So let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you very much because you love us very much and you are patient with us. And Lord, we do not want to just be talking to ourselves and among our, ourselves and ignore and forget about our youth and young adults. But we want to involve every single one. For you have called all of us to work for you. You have called every single one of us to be a disciple, a follower, a doer. And so Lord, I just leave these young people in your hands and I just ask for your Holy Spirit on them. I also appeal and ask that you be with us, the adults, as we mentor our young adults, as we mentor our youth, as we are patient with them and we love them. Because, Lord, you are merciful and kind to us. So help us to reflect that same mercy and kindness to them. Bless your church, not just here in Cleburne, but all around the world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.